financial independence, country shopping, van nomadism, security culture, ethical enclaves, crypto anarchy, legal interstices, survivalism. Join your host, Shane and Kyle, as they explore this freedom strategy known as Vaughn. You're listening to the Vani Podcast. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. So this episode is titled Vani and Cities, and the show notes can be found at vanipodcast.com forward slash 29. Uh, so not an intermission episode. This is, uh, you know, one of the mainline season two, uh, you know, episodes. So we've covered a lot thus far in this podcast, such as wilderness Vani, van nomadism, minimal sailboating, intentional communities, etc., all of those requiring drastic lifestyle changes, and for the most part, strategic relocation, uh, or you know, just uh, temporary autonomous zones, mobility, uh, you know, in general, uh, to areas unfamiliar uh, to most in the uh, servile society. Uh, you know, when you're uh, complete, when when uh, I don't I don't remember the percentage, but the large majority of people are, I guess, uh, you know, you know, uh, I guess relegated to these uh, these urban areas, uh, and I'm sure a lot of audio listeners are too. Uh, you know, myself included, and Kyle, you too, there in Austin, right? Uh, so, so a lot of these, a lot of these strategies we've talked about, uh, you know, where, where you kind of leave that society behind, uh, you know, may, you know, be strange and unfamiliar to, to a lot of listeners, don't you think? Well, yeah, it was the, uh, I've, I've even written about this before. It was, uh, CI world Factbook mentioned that approximately, what was it? Uh, 80 some odd, 83%, whatever the precise percentage was well over three fourths of Americans live in urban areas, uh, cities, uh, maybe they also threw the suburbs in there too. Uh, so never mind people who live in small towns, never mind people who live in rural areas, and never mind the people in those rural areas who are truly independent in terms of their own elect- uh, electrical production, food production, uh, plumbing, sewage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all that kind of ba- what you would normally think of as basic infrastructure. Um, yeah, I mean, we're talking, I mean, you're getting, you're at that point, you're talking about what arguably 5% or less of the entire population. And there's like what approximately 300 some odd million Americans, 320 million, whatever the latest, uh, census figures say. So yeah, the fact that you have over three fourths of those hundred millions in cities, uh, is not an insignificant detail uh, when it comes to looking at uh, lifestyles and and whether changes to said lifestyles are worth anything, right, right, and this is why I think I've said this before. Uh, maybe you know, maybe I, I remember exactly when, but uh, I really do think you know this topic, Vanu and cities, uh, could be the most popular set of episodes that we do because you know what you know, Kyle, you know, subjective value, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people don't want to go. Uh, you know, live in rural areas. Some people, you know, like some things about the city. Uh, and you just said, you know, over 80% of, you know, Americans live in, in, uh, in cities. So, so this is, this, this is going to be a couple of episodes that will certainly, uh, appeal or at least, uh, or, or at least come to the same level as a lot of, uh, a lot of folks that, that may be listening. Yeah, and much like how you were look back when we were doing season one, you were looking forward to when the episode in uh, season two that we've done already on minimalist sailboating uh, and all that. Well, the season two episode I've been looking forward to is well the one we're doing tonight about uh, it, whether it's possible or not to vanu in the cities, uh, because well the cities are kind of the hives of industry and culture. And uh, a couple other things, manufacturing as well, and and so on and so forth. So it's not some like insignificant thing, right? I mean, people. You remember when Sam Conkin would mention about the retreaters like running away to the woods or something like that, or or oh, however yeah, he phrased it. Retreaters, yeah. Yeah. So I guess Sam Conkin was okay living in the cities, I suppose, uh, for his own reasons. Maybe the reason he uh, thought so was something to the effect. I'm speculating a little bit here, ladies and gentlemen, but maybe some of the effect of, well, if you're going to engage in counter-economic trading, which, which of course, we've done the episode uh, earlier on ethical enclaves. Please see uh, earlier episode on that topic. Uh, you know, whether, whether you call it an ethical enclave or you call it the Agora, that your greater uh, probability of finding trading partners would probably be in urban areas. I would assume is what Konkin was kind of making his assumptions on when he was, you know, kind of decried, you know, de- decrying the, uh, uh, you know, Rayo and, and similar folk. Right, right. And I think another reason, too, was, you know, he, he, he enjoyed the, the intellectual discussions, you know, reaching status, you know, where they are. 
Uh, and uh, but according to uh, I interviewed Wally Konkin, the author of uh, Gore's Class Theory. Well, kind of the author, kind of not. He he kind of compiled uh, you know Konkin's work on it and just added kind of I guess explanations and, and things of that nature. But I talked to him about it. And there used to be back in the 70s and 80s uh, out in uh, out in Southern California, you know, like there'd be weekly meetings. Uh, you know, kind of, I, I guess, kind of, uh, you know, in the names of, uh, you know, kind of the great libertarian philosophers of the past. So, uh, so Conk and I, I do think that another reason he liked the cities was he liked. I mean, that's where that's that's where you, uh, you know, reach people face to face, right? I mean, if you want to have a, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of hard to do that, uh, you know, Rayo style, right? I mean, that's not necessarily what Rayo did, other than you know, communicating through publications. And and yeah, and obviously, like even Rayo himself would mention that he was practicing wilderness Vanu, but that would not necessarily be for everybody, right? So he kind of understood that. And obviously, you know, we're, we're mentioning about real life here and so forth. Let me make a, just a slight digression, mention about even uh, libertarian fiction. So, for example, like the events in Alongside Night, that's pretty much exclusively happening in urban areas. Whether it's the counter-economic activity, whether it was uh, like Aurora, that underground kind of city, mall, complex type thing. That was even underneath like another city and so forth. Uh, city within a city or city underneath a city, so to speak. Um, if you look at like hashtag Agora, you know, most of that's happening in Germany and, and urban areas, whether it was, uh, you know, Berlin or, or Dresden or wherever else. And even other locales not in Germany were mostly in the cities, except for like one scene that was in a rural area. So there was like a homage paid to finding independence of some sort in a rural area. It was actually on a farm. But um, and I think they were producing raw, <laughs> raw milk and selling it, too, in, in that novel. Oh, you criminals. Yeah, exactly. To keep with the theme, because it was a big, big thing of uh, on a, on a, actually crypto agorism specifically. But yeah, but even in that novella, hashtag agora, uh, most of the events that were happening and most of the characters were themselves, you know, city rats. And, you know, there's the old adage about, you know, city rats versus country mice, which I think is very uh, apt for this particular episode of TVP is that when you look at a lot of Rayo's writings, I guess maybe you could say, I guess you, <laughs> I guess you had a guy who was a bit of a country mouse, at least in, to some extent. Um, but then when he's talking about the servile society, a lot of the language he's using and how he's describing it, he's kind of describing a lot of city rats, which for the most part is pretty accurate. <laughs> you know, um, I, I can't disagree with him too much as far as that goes. But I guess what we're kind of trying looking at here tonight is, um, I guess one way of phrasing it would be, is it possible to be a country mouse uh, surrounded by city rats, <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it. <laughs> hey, I, I like that. I like that. I, I, I certainly do. And, and it also is worth notice or worth mentioning that this is a very little developed strategy by Rayo. Uh, he he wrote uh, you know one chapter, a page and a half. We'll read the entire thing for you tonight. It was a very little developed strategy, so that leaves a lot of work for Colin and I in season three. Uh, you know, when we really, really dive into this, but, uh, you know, as is the, uh, as has been the, the case for season two, we're going to look at what Rayo had to say. We're going to obviously define some terms. And, uh, in this episode, we're going to look at, uh, the individual methods that, uh, Rayo mentioned, as well as, uh, you know, just looking at, uh, what he had to say. And we'll obviously, uh, expound upon that a little bit, but, uh, but uh, a lot of that will be saved for season three. And, uh, when we get to season three, Kyle, uh, Vanu and Cities will probably be five to 10 episodes by itself. Oh yeah, oh yeah, easily. I I can totally see that. Oh, and and one other thing too before we get before we get into definitions, I think another major reason why even exploring even the possibility of whether one could be Vanu within the cities is because for a lot of people who may not yet be financially independent, uh such as yours truly, uh there's not a lot of options to necessarily kind of wing it and, and go it out in the rural areas. Not to imply that it takes a lot of money. It really doesn't, right? There's guys like Alex Ansari and Van, others. Van who, Nomad is a man. It's cheap. And more specifically, yes. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, but then again, not everybody wants to live in a car or van or RV. So there, there is a little bit of a give and take. 
Uh, there is some people would be a quality of life issue. Other times it's uh, family, right? Uh, some people, they're not living alone. And even if, you know, even if, jo let's say hypothetically, even if John wanted to live in a van, Becky might not want to because that's not the lifestyle to which she has been accustomed, right? Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, shades of gray here. So for whatever the, my point is, for whatever the reasons are, being able to at least be a little bit veneur within the cities has a lot of uh, potential for people who uh, were the other methods that we've already discussed this uh, second season uh, might not necessarily be available for. So even if somebody was interested, say, in minimalist sailboating, but for whatever reason, uh, they even if they're like already, you know, reading books on sailboating and all that, in the meantime, while they're preparing, for example, to do the sailboating, they can at least increase their invulnerability to coercion while they're still in the cities before they go sailboating. So it's also, again, there's kind of like a sequence of events thing kind of going on here too, while they're also pursuing some uh, another method. Right. No, you're, you're, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. But yeah, I guess get, getting back to it, you know, let's talk about the, what, the methods that Rayo mentioned here real briefly, not going into a lot of detail because he will, uh, I guess he won't really go into a lot of detail, right? I guess we'll, we'll go into a lot of detail when we, when we get to those certain points. But here are the methods that Rayo mentioned uh, as possibilities. And since you were talking about van nomadism, Kyle, you don't just have to do that in, uh, you know, so-called uh, national parks. Uh, you can do van nomadism with city squat spots. I think Alex Ansari did that for uh, for at least uh, a little while. Um, going mm -hmm. down the line here, uh, park squatting, which uh, that may be a little difficult now, uh, <laughs> considering you know kind of the uh, spikes in the benches for uh, for homeless to deal with the homeless, uh, as has been uh, kind of uh, you know a very contentious issue. Uh, hidden bed chambers, which he mentioned in previous episodes, uh, you know, in ghettos, uh, a possibility, possibility sure. And then uh, anonymity, you know, kind of uh, practicing the gray man, which Jason and I, Jason Booth and I actually talked about that in uh, last week's episode. Uh, as a as a way to to you know practice Vanu in the city, we touched on it very very briefly. But uh, you can also I guess urban anonymity, uh, where you, you know, again you practice the gray man, you practice very good security culture, and uh, you kind of just blend into the environment, uh, which is uh, much like uh, you know living in a ghetto, uh, which we'll get into more. But anything there? Yeah, that that's kind of a good overview, and we'll go into more detail on. The anonymity, the ghetto, the park squatting, the bedchamber, and the van nomadism with city squat spots as we go along here. But yeah, those are the five methods that Rayo mentioned were what he thought of as uh, practicing Vanu in the cities. But I wouldn't be surprised that maybe going into season three, maybe there's more, but we'll save that for then. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, we will. And uh, I think in season three, we might even be able to come up with some some new uh, possibilities. But uh, got to leave you. we got to leave you in some suspense. So you keep listening. Right. Uh, <laughs> not that you not that you would. Hopefully you would anyways. But uh, let's let's get into definitions here. And since I'm uh, the lead guy for this episode, that's uh, you're the definition man. So what is uh, Urban Vanu? Urban Vanu is defined as enjoying comparatively more invulnerability to coercion being veneur within a metropolitan area despite city psychological pressures. Yeah, very, you know, very, very simple. It's uh, the, the, it's just Vanu, you know, becoming as invulnerable to coercion as you possibly can only within a city. Now, what did Rayo have to say about this subject? Not a whole lot, but uh, I'll start with this kind of a shorter quote. We'll discuss that, and then I'll read the the, the chapter. Well, we'll see what I do with the chapter. I might stop and, and, and we might stop and comment on it. We'll see. It's a very short article, so we could do it either way and it would be fine. But uh, we'll deal with that uh, as we cross uh, you know, as we, as we cross that bridge. So this first one, quote, liberation does seem to be easier in un uninhabited areas, at least as a do-it-yourself thing, which it necessarily is for, first, for the first pioneers. But it is also possible in large cities. Imagine, for example, an old expensive building, which appears to be only a private club, but which conceals an entranceway to apartments and workshops tunneled underneath, end quote. That's from Libertarian Connection number five, November 17th, 1970. And keep in mind, Libertarian Connection was this big, massive publication. Uh, I actually found an issue of it that someone took pictures of. I'm going digit to digitize that at some point. There's some that's illegible. But uh, it was cool to look at the table of contents. So you had Walter Block, like the second article, and you had Rayo in like the fourth. So like I screenshot, I took that, I posted that picture on the Vani podcast page, like, that's pretty neat, right? You know, like Ray, you know, just two two articles below Walter Block. Uh, all he's he's obviously got his problems, but just somebody with his notoriety today, uh, you know, being placed, you know, in the same publication as Ray. Just pretty pretty cool. Just kind of a side note there. But 
something that Jason Booth has said often, you know, in the in those intermission episodes, is that when you're an uninhabited, the, the, the more people there are, the more coercion exists, right? The, the, in in that area, uh, if you live in a big city, that's more enforcers. That's uh, more uh, that makes it more difficult to become uh, more invulnerable to coercion. But in uninhabited areas, or in very very small cities with you know 50 or 100 people, um, there's not a lot of coercion there. There's not. Uh, he calls them limited coercion zones, uh, is, 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 is kind of the way that he puts it. So I think that's a very, very good point to kind of start off with. Uh, maybe if you'll have a response, maybe you, I'm sure you will. But, uh, you know, it's obviously easier in uninhabited areas. Uh, but uh, what do you think? I disagree. I don't think it's the number of people. I think it's the density. Consider, for instance, a prison cell. You can. There's only at most, even even when they're kind of shoving a bunch of prisoners into a cell, there's not that many. What four, five, six, however many the states now doing nowadays. Uh, but there's plenty of coercion if the prisoners really don't like each other or they just want to rape each other or whatever it is. So that doesn't take a lot of them, but there's definitely more of it. Or even if it's not something like a prison, even if it's like a bunch of people who technically have their liberty, but they're all like in a one bedroom apartment. Uh, that's a greater probability of, of coercion automatically, at least I think so, because there's no boundaries. And more to the point, uh, they're, they're all densely packed in tight. Um, you know, also look at, you know, even in certain, I mean, even with those uh, storms that happened, uh, you know, a few months back, I think it was during the latter end of uh, the sum, this past summer, uh, when Houston and some other areas got, you know, and I think it was a couple areas in Florida, got deluged with uh, this hurricane and that hurricane and so forth, right? Harvey being one of them. And really, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, go to the refugee camp or whatever. And it's kind of like, okay, again, it's not the number of refugees. The fact, I mean, it's kind of like if you go way, way back to like Hurricane Katrina back at what happened in New Orleans. Oh, yeah, let's shove everybody in the Superdome. Technically, there wasn't that many people. But in a relative sense, the, it was very densely packed. And the problem with cities is that it's not the amount of people. It's the fact they're all shoved into such tiny spaces. If you had the exact same number of people, but they had more space per foot, then I don't think the coercion would be anywhere likely. And, and even, even, if it's, even if it was just person-on-person -person crime. That's also a reason why I think at some point, especially once the state is abolished, if that ever comes to pass or, or, or close enough, then uh, for, for people to go spacefaring as they are able, because that's another way of branching out of reducing density too. So even for the environmentalists who are concerned about this thing going extinct or not enough water or whatever the hell they're worried about, it doesn't matter whether climate change is real or not. If people can get off this planet, well, human race's survival is pretty much uh, not a guarantee, but looking a lot better because there's less of density. We're not limited to one planet. We can spread out, spread out, spread out. And that's part of freedom too. You know, you can be, I guess you can have your communes occasionally and shove everybody in, in an area, but those are people who already have similar values. The real tricky thing is when you have a bunch of people who don't have similar values, should they really be put in densely packed areas? <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, whether it's a prison cell or a one bedroom apartment, uh, yeah, I, I hope I hope you guys really like each other. <laughs> right, right, and, and I can certainly understand what you're saying there. I guess the I, I guess it was more more so a comparison when we when we discussed it uh, in previous episodes, like the Siskiyou region versus say Chicago. Um, and maybe yeah, maybe it's not the only factor too, but uh, but generally speaking, I mean smaller towns like uh, you know where I went to uh, you know uh, high school, you know, government schools. Uh, it was a very, uh, you know, a very small town. There wasn't a lot of coercion, minus the property taxes, which are pretty outrageous, uh, the yeah. property theft. Uh, but as far as you, I guess the da the daily tyrannies that that's, that's that we've talked about before, uh, you know, there really weren't, a, you know, a whole, there really weren't a whole lot of them. There was one police, there was one bludgy in town, and uh, he was a lazy piece of shit. <laughs> and uh, there there was one alley, there was an alley, and he would he would put his he would he would park his car. Where you could see like the police, so you could see kind of on the side of the car, so you'd slow down before you got to got to him, so you didn't have to like take the time to write you a ticket, which I appreciate the hell out of that. I don't know about <laughs> other people. He got fired, you know, a couple of years back, I think. But but regardless, I do think kind of like the, the the smaller towns, and also where we where we uh, the, the town nearest to uh, to where we where I'm going to be homesteading, where we go riding and camping, uh, it's a small town of like 50 people, and uh, you know the they don't have uh, they don't have police. 
they have a volunteer fire department, and then there's uh you know there's a, a, sh- a county sheriff from somewhere else that comes every once in a great while, but he's not really there. Um, so I, I guess in, in in some of those anecdotal examples, I do think it certainly is correct that uh you know the less people, the less coercion. So I think that kind of factors into it too. If there's less people, there's less money to be put into public services. I think that's a very you know great thing. Um, so he, he kind of lays out, uh, you know, some initial, initial, and this was just kind of a, uh, for some context on this quote, this was just something from the end, end of an article where he kind of proposed, a, you know, a couple of things and, and he develops it more in, in the article we're going to read uh, next. But, uh, but yeah, uh, it's possible in large cities, uh, an old expensive building, which appears to be only a private club, but which conceals an entrance with apartments and workshops tunneled underneath. I do think that's interesting for, for quite a few reasons, but just just imagine kind of this uh, this Vanuan uh, underground unknown apartment complex. I think it'd be pretty. It's a pretty neat idea. Uh, but just I guess just a couple examples he lays out there. But uh, what what are your thoughts initially before we get on to the I guess the more in depth article, which isn't really in depth. Uh speakeasies. Remember those speakeasies like during alcohol prohibition and and whatever else. Yeah, those would be kind of like uh, you know, uh like an underground, sometimes quite literally, right? They had their own structures and so forth and they had to be as invulnerable to coercion as possible, which wasn't always 100% cuz remember the speakeasies got raided and such. That was kind of a normal thing. But then there were other ones that went untouched. Either the cops were paid off or they honestly didn't know about them or or whatever. So yeah, when when I read when when you were reading that, I, that was the first thing I thought of were the speakeasies. So maybe some inspiration could be taken from those. Oh yeah, if it's uh, you know underground activities. I mean even a uh, even in the uh, there's uh, another book on Loom Panics. I can't remember if it's Guerrilla Capitalism or if it's uh, How to Do Business Off the Books. Both uh, both you know great books by Adam Cash. Uh, one of them is out there for free. Uh, uh, just go to go to com forward slash Guerrilla Capitalism to get that one. But uh, I don't remember which one it was, but there was a chapter in there, you know, learning from actual criminals. Uh, you know, Venuans could learn some things from them. You know, they have to stay underground. They have to stay hidden, uh, you know, lest they end up in a cage, right? So well, let's go ahead and get on to this, uh, you know, the, the final, I guess the, the final excerpts here. Uh, this is from Vonnie Life Publication. This is number five, January 1972. Let's go ahead and get into it. And this is called, well, you know, very appropriately, Vonnie Cities. Crazy how we came up with that title. Uh, so let's get to a quote. Most discussions of Vanu living assume uh, unpopulated or faraway places. Concerning urban possibilities, five possible approaches come to mind. The first and simplest is anonymity. Be visible but not noticeable. Conform outwardly while doing your own thing in secret. Be inconspicuous, as Alan Humble says in his article, but most of Humble's advice concerns what not to do. Where does Humble go to do his own thing? Probably not to his apartment. Renting under a gnome de plume does not prevent inspection by landlord or police, or overhearing by nosy neighbors. Humble speaks of children, but I wonder if he has any. He says to keep children out of sight during school hours. I wouldn't want the job of keeping children quietly cooped up in an apartment during slave age hours, uh, slave school hours. Incidentally, I've heard that California has lowered slave age to six. Regarding Humble's recommendation uh, to avoid paying by check, I agree if the transaction is face-to-face, large or repeating. But selling small items by mail, like Vanu Life, for cash only isn't feasible, so you are welcome to pay by check. Urban anonymity offers no protection from such dangers as nuclear war. Despite these criticisms, I agree with most of Humble's recommendations, many of which apply to all Vanuans, not just urban anonym- uh, anonymites. I live much of the way Humble advocates before taking up van nomadism. For me, anonymity alone was unsatisfactory because of city psychological pressures. I was immersed in an alien culture with values hostile to my own. Whether or not I was especially vulnerable, I felt vulnerable. I know of quite a few Vanuists and Libertarians who live Humble's way, but I know none who seem to like it for very long. Perhaps there are, wa- there are ways to cope with these psychological pressures. If you think you have found a way, tell us. But personally, I prefer to live far enough back in the woods. Uh, end quote. We'll stop there. So yeah, that would be the urban anonymity approach. And, uh, you know, Kyle, I do think there's, there, there are certainly ways to, to, to pursue this strategy of Vanu, but... Uh, I don't know, man. The the city psychological pressures, uh, no matter how great you are being invulnerable to coercion, uh, I don't know. I I dislike people. I dislike the safe survival society. So that seems like it would be uh, quite difficult to me. Okay, so there's at least two elements at play here. There's kind of the security culture part of it, and then there's the, I would agree, the city psychological pressures. So let's take uh, these one at a time. 
So there was that article I wrote a little while back, which was the uh, entitled Blending in the Art of the Gray Man. And this was more about, well, the concept of the gray man, which is part, uh, which is a technique of the good security culture. And I, I think that's what, uh, when Rayo was kind of mentioning about what Alan Humble said in his own article about uh, urban anonymity, what they're really kind of talking about is being the gray man, right? And and hiding in plain sight and so forth and not causing a ruckus and, and kind of being bland and drab as possible, at least in some sense, right? And, you know, there's different elements to that. There's It's not just appearance. It's also behavior. And then at the same time, there's also you have to have good situational awareness. And then, of course, uh, as, as, as the uh, survivalists and so-called preppers would call it, uh, you should consider having some sort of everyday carry uh, items on you of one kind or another. A little bit of a different topic. I'm only mentioning it here because that's that would be, be really being kind of anonymous in, a, in an urban context, right? Where you're just kind of like, oh, I'm just, you know, John Doe. I'm nobody special, but yet you can pretty much handle whatever kind of comes your way. And you're closer to being invulnerable, invulnerable to coercion within within that context. And I, I, I think that's uh, I think that's definitely something worth, if not necessarily a lifestyle change, at least learn how to do it. So if you do need to use it or you do choose to use it, then it, it's kind of like a skill set you've already developed. And I think that that's kind of good on its own merits regarding right, the and, other. And I guess so, so one, one one point there and I'll, I'll mention Adam Cash again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly these things are possible and. Uh, you know, there, there are strategies to, to I, I guess, uh, there are solutions to, to the issues that may arise if you're, if you're uh, you know, pursuing venues in a city. Um, but I, I, I still, I, I'll, I'll kind of reiterate this again. I think it'd be very, very difficult. Uh, from Adam Cash's, you know, writings, he, he practiced good security culture, thankfully, but he did seem a little bit like a controlled schizophrenic. I mean, he talked about it, like, a lot about the Constitution. Uh, and the law, and you know, uh, uh, and, and there was some, there were some status things in there, but at the same time, there were a lot of great strategies that he proposed at that time. Uh, you know, the banking and finance world has changed quite a bit, uh, but at the same time, I, uh, I I do think there's there's some valuable things in that book. But uh, <laughs> well, I yeah, think Adam, I, Cash... I, I don't know, I, I think he's kind of an example of maybe the city psychological pressures. You know, being very very good on some things. You know, avoiding the the uh, the, the theft known as taxation. Uh, and proposing strategies for others to pursue, but uh, I still think that there's there's that kind of underlying theme here. What you're what you're about to get into uh, is is the city psychological pressures. Yeah, and I'm and I'm glad you mentioned Adam Cash. So I, I think that's kind of an example where somebody's kind of focusing way too much on practicality and not enough on philosophical grounding, because without a philosophical grounding, it's 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 pretty much you know game set match. It's pretty much a fait accompli that said individual is going to become a controlled schizophrenic sooner or later because if they you know if you don't believe in something you'll fall for anything kind of thing so if you don't have a philosophical grounding then yeah of course you're going to start contradicting yourself without realizing it and so forth that being said um even if somebody were to practice their urban anonymity and practice good security culture more generally and being you know really good at being the gray man more specifically the uh, yin to that yang would, of course, be the city's psychological pressures. And it's not just the pollution. It's not just the traffic noise like outside my apartment. It's not just the stress of traveling in the traffic to get to work uh, or if not necessarily to work to run other errands, whether it's grocery stores or, you know, pick any one of uh, the different services that uh, such an urban area provides and so forth that you have to pay for. Uh, with Federal Reserve notes or, or preferably with something better. Uh, it's not it's not just that. It's also the culture, right? It's it's the servile society in its most concentrated form, uh, at least in some sense, uh, because there's a whole bunch of people who are uh, <laughs> essentially pushing this, uh, as Rayo himself kind of put it, an alien culture with values hostile to his own. And that's that's something you can't really easy, easily get away from, right? I mean, we, we can have a lot of discussions about infrastructure, whether it's, whether it's certain types of industries, whether it's more physical things like bridges, tunnels, and so forth. But then there's culture, there's behavior, and, and so forth, and, and certain assumptions that people are making. And that, uh, that can get kind of messy real quickly in the sense of, like, how do you deal with that? So, you know, I mean, me personally... If, if people were more kind of less densely packed in and more spread out, 
the ease of which to exercise one's freedom of association and disassociation both, uh, I think would be a lot easier as opposed to if you're all crammed in pretty much the same area, then even if you do try to ostracize somebody from your own social circle or even work circle or so forth, uh, if you're all on packed on top of each other, where shall we say, will we see each other in rush hour, hypothetically, or whatever, it gets kind of uncomfortable really quickly. So, right, I don't know. right, and and I, I guess one other thing too, you mentioned the culture, and if you're if, if you're, I mean, let's look at Rayo for a moment here. So, what was he exposed to out in his uh, polyethylene A10 early on, and probably some sort of a troglodyte, more of a troglodyte dwelling, uh, more uh, completely underground or or partially underground. Um, what was he exposed to as far as culture was, uh, or kind of those those very dangerous uh, ideas that culture propagates, such as nationalism or war or uh, or theft on a on a grand scale uh, called taxation? Um, how 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 much was he exposed to that? Well, I, I would say, you know, unfortunately, it's it's sad that uh, you know it's sad that, that that this was true. But I'm sure in some of the publications he received, uh, the libertarian publications, uh, he did see some of those things, uh, kind of that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, kind of the, the the unfortunate aspects of of, of culture that uh, you know that uh, you know for those who for those of us who who do uh, try to practice Vonu and City at this point without the ideas being fully developed yet yeah, it'll be season three uh, it's kind of a bombardment of, of these things any sort of entertainment you you attend uh, or or partake in will likely you know nine ninety nine point nine nine percent chance will be just filled with uh, you know the, those very uh, those very um, you know nasty dirty things. Uh, that states like to do. So so I guess the, the point here is you got to have a very, very strong mind to deal with all of that. And then secondly, uh, and I get to mention this, Kyle, this is what I was going to say in the beginning of the episode, got to be, you got to be utilizing that trivia method. You got to have, uh, you know, well, you got to have, uh, you know, the correct, all of the grammar you can get, come to the right conclusions, and then be able to you know, make those uh, you know turn turn those conclusions into actionable things. Uh, if you're if you're dealing with yeah. uh, with bad grammar, uh, if you're dealing with uh, you know bad information, you're going to come to wrong conclusions, and then uh, the actions that you take, or the uh, hopefully not, but uh, the the policies that you advocate for, uh, will be uh, wrong. They won't be based on truth. So yeah, I, I think it, in order for for this to be possible, I really do think those two things are, are very necessary. A very strong mind uh, to be able to deal with that. Um, uh, and also got to, got to be utilizing that trivia method, man. And just in the past, and Kyle, just in the past few months, I've really been digging more into that, uh, more so than I ever had before. And I think that's kind of the, the main issue, I guess the, the that's the core issue that, uh, <laughs> that's, that's the core, core reason why the state of survival society exists is the lack of the utilization of tri the trivia method, the lack of critical thinking. And then uh, obviously the government schools and the indoctrination that comes with that. Yeah, and 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 not to belabor the the point too much about this, but the city psychological pressures take more than one form, right? Whether it's certain pressures on the job, or here's actually a non-job related one: waiting in line. I don't know about you guys, but I can't remember the last time I was in a rural area or even a small town where I was waiting in line for anything, even even with a local uh, you know government bureaucrats. There's like no such thing as lines for the most man. part. But in cities. There's a line for everything, even the so-called free market activity. There's lines, grocery stores, pick a place. There's just it's, again, it's density, I think. And uh, and see, that's the other thing too. Even if it's like a day off, whether it's the weekend or something else, and even if you're just let's just say hypothetically, let's just say you're quote unquote shopping. Let's just say make it like a part day or all day thing. It takes a lot of time to go, especially if it's different stops you have to make for whether it's different errands or even something that's fun. You know, it takes time to get in the car and then drive and find a place to park and go inside and then do whatever the activity is and however long that takes. And then you have to get back in the car, drive around again, find another parking spot and it's wash, rinse, repeat. And next thing you know, like five, six, seven, eight. I've had, you know, where I was, you know, doing stuff with the, with the wife, we we're just going out and doing stuff. Next thing you know, it's like six hours later. And we're not even half done. And we've had to just like put certain things off because it just takes so long to get anywhere to do anything. And it's like, wow, this is rather inconvenient. So this, pers so what these city rats do culturally, where they make everything so quote unquote efficient and quote unquote convenient, and then everything takes five times longer to get anything done. Doesn't matter whether it's going to a laundromat or grocery shopping or 
even something more recreational. It just takes forever to get around to do anything even before you even get there. Uh, but uh, but let's get back to this uh, to this uh, article uh, real quick. Quote, a way to reduce psychological pressures is to gather with fellows into a ghetto, a second approach to city volume. One loses anonymity with respect to the larger culture as one develops subculture, speech, customs, mannerisms, and dress. One becomes a relatively indistinguishable member of the subculture, requiring that any organized aggressor attack everyone or no one. Uh, and this is a uh, quote. This isn't Rayo speaking. All Chinese niggers hippies look alike. And back to Rayo. This doesn't always stop aggressors. Witness Jews and Nazi. Uh, witness Jews in Nazi Germany, Japanese in uh, the U.S. The recommendations made by Walt Hayward uh, presume ghettos of like-minded people. His objections against moving into the wildlands are directed to retreatists who hope to do it at the last moment, not at Venuans who expect to live there most of the time. And quote, and we'll stop there just for a moment. But yeah, you know the Japanese didn't fare very well. Uh, you know the 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 Japanese the uh, Americans of Japanese descent didn't uh, fare very well after uh, World War II, did they? And they and they were Americans. Americans Americans did not fare well because the racist federal government said, "Oh, your ancestors have elliptical folds." Uh, on their eyes. Therefore, you're basically the equivalent of a terrorist Go into the concentration camps, but I'm FDR, but yet I'm not Hitler. I mean, come on, grow up. But it can't happen here. Nope. It did <laughs> at the same time. That's the worst God. part. Trivia method. You don't have the proper grammar, folks. Um, but anyways, uh, uh, I, I guess as far as the rest of this, uh, I don't know. I mean, I suppose in some in some circumstances you, the, there would be kind of the approach of attack everyone or no one, but uh, you know uh, uh, what was the uh, the uh, this the uh, Waco the, what what's, what brand of church were they were what, what brand of religion were they? Um, oh, I, I what, don't remember. It's some it really was. specific Protestants uh, sect kind of thing. Yeah. Right, right. So so even so so yeah, I guess it might not be the ghetto that Ray was referring to. Not uh, you know something that kind of blatant. But uh, but still, I mean, there, there's there are plenty of examples throughout history where that might not work. Uh, and plus, with the increasing uh, hostility from the status of all society, with people just pursuing fan nomadism uh, alone, let alone with a group of people. Um, and then you look at, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, you know kind of the uh, the spikes on the benches to prevent homeless people from sleeping there. Uh, you know, I think I think this sort of a strategy would be difficult. Uh, in modern day uh, America, where the state of society attacks anybody with uh, with a different lifestyle than, than they view as uh, as uh, classy or whatever whatever it is, right? Yeah, pretty much. All right, back to it. Ray is going to kind of conclude his thoughts uh, on this approach. I just wanted to mention those couple of things real quick. Uh, back to it. Quote: Ghettos are also possible in rural areas. The te the Tequilma area southeast of Cave Junction, Oregon, is almost a free ghetto. While freaks may not be in the majority yet, they're enough to render the area unattractive for anti-freaks, causing most land up for sale to be bought by freaks, etc. And now guess to what happens in new black ghettos and cities. How much protection this provides remains to be seen. There have been quite a few arrests for growing, using pot, etc. A bigger crunch will come when substantial numbers of freaks, uh, freak children, become old enough for slave school. Will the Supreme Court, uh, end quotes, I love that, require long hairs and short hairs to be intermixed by busing? Or will it compel kids to cut their hair middle length with the length set by the majority vote every four years? End quote. Man, <laughs> I love that. that. That last portion in quotes. Will the Supreme Court require long hairs and short hairs to be intermixed by busing? Or will it, be, will it compel kids to cut their hair middle length with the length set by the majority vote every four years? So fantastic. You know, another – I <laughs> – Probably pretty obvious to, to, to people listening to this podcast, but I, I, I love the kind of the, the eloquent phrasing that Rayo has for kind of proposing these philosophical ideas. Yeah, he's basically ridiculing the whole anti-discrimination laws and such, right? I mean, and, and also the busing laws, which were part of that, right, as well as many other things. So this second method of, for lack of a better term, the ghetto method is the idea where so it's it's kind of more of a collective version of the previous method, whereas the previous method it's more individually based, right? You are the gray man. You are kind of – there's kind of an implication that you're alone. Here, though, with the ghetto method, it's kind of like if you got a bunch of gray men together, but not necessarily – they're not really gray anymore. They're kind of like taking on a certain persona 
or certain shared cultural attributes in any sense. Sometimes skin color, yes, but not always. Uh, you know, hence like the old, all the hippies look alike, right? That's not limited to, heck, that's not even limited to gender, right? Because there's also the women folk, right? So uh, there, there's lots of there's lots of different ways to kind of look at this. And so, yeah, the whole ghetto thing might might be kind of interesting. You know, it's actually interesting here too. Like here in Austin, there's like a certain segment of the population which is very uh, hipster, very much so, especially in downtown. And you can pretty much see them. So, yeah, if somebody were to adopt kind of like a, a hipster aesthetic, uh, that could be a type of ghetto of sorts, I guess. And, and another possibility that came to mind is – or I guess not a possibility, but something that came to mind when reading this. Uh, so, so the idea would be to, I guess, move into an area, uh, buy up all the land, and dissuade any uh, any squares <laughs> from from wanting to move into the area. So would this be similar to, uh, you know, there's this uh, really, and, and for for good reason, and in, in some circumstances, I mean, it's always done, uh, you know, via the local government. They can get more in taxes, they can charge more for property taxes, so they're going to subsidize and uh, all of that. That's obviously terrible. Uh, if there's a market demand for it, then sure. But uh, gentrification, uh, you know, where there's this small city and, uh, you know, more, you know, lower, I guess, lower to middle class folks. And, uh, you know, these rich folks come in and, uh, uh, you know, get uh, grants from government. Uh, you know, there might be some in a domain where, uh, you know, we need a road built here. Can you guys help us? Sure, we'll get paid a lot more money or we'll, we'll be able to steal a lot more money. So, sure, we'll, we'll do that. Um, so I wonder if that would be kind of an example of kind of uh, – it wouldn't be a ghetto, though, right? Uh, I guess it would be kind of a – I don't know. I don't know. That's, that's, that's what came to mind, to mind to me is kind of changing it so that it's uh, – you know, the, the area is unattractive to, to the folks that, you know, have lived there for forever uh, and turning it into, uh, you know, something else where they can become invisible and just be another one of those uh, – another one of those, uh, you know, I guess squares. Uh, you know, the, uh, the people who buy, uh, you know, a house in suburbia, uh, you know, kind of have uh, the really uh, – uppity main street sort of things I, I don't know maybe that'd be kind of a counter ghetto i don't know i i would say that you know i'm glad you brought up gentrification because that really is kind of the counter ghetto i mean the whole notion of a ghetto of any kind based on any criteria whatsoever was that it was always anti-establishment not that necessarily any particular ghetto was necessarily ethical or or worthwhile but that it was uniquely distinctive even between other ghettos uh, relative to the mainstream culture, so more of a subculture of sorts. And, you know, like, for example, like back in the 1920s or thereabouts, you know, there were Irish ghettos, the Irish tenements in New York City. Those were ghettos. So those people would technically, the Irish would technically, be, you know, be called so-called Caucasians, but they weren't part of American mainstream culture, not even a little bit. Even the second generation ones weren't even part of uh, American culture because they weren't allowed to be, even though many of them tried to assimilate and many of them have eventually did once you got into like third and fourth generation and so forth. Um, the Italian, uh, again, so-called Caucasians from Europe, uh, but they had, you know, the Italian ghettos, again, in New York City, uh, to use another kind of example of, of a so-called ghetto and so forth. Uh, there are the various Chinese ghettos, usually in the, on the West Coast in various areas, whether it be Los Angeles or other places, uh, that those would be so-called ghettos. Heck, even the – oh, this is perfect. Even the very concept of a Chinatown. There's even a Chinatown in Washington, D.C., by the way, for people who don't know. The very concept of a Chinatown is a type of ghetto. <laughs> <laughs> or at least it used to be. Now it's just this term that's usually used to kind of uh, have a kind of certain flavorful of, of uh, f a flavor of gentrification, unfortunately. But what it originally was was basically a very definable, even in physical space, uh, subculture that was uh, really at odds and different from the mainstream one. The problem with gentrification is that that's now a counter move by the more mainstream servile society to basically to basically uh, absorb and dilute uh, those counter establishment, anti establishment ghettos of various flavors. So I know that libertarians usually are very polycentric. And that's where the kind of ghettos kind of uh, more or less by the time – if you look at it like in the aggregate, sure. But gentrification is basically the authoritarian uh, uh, reaction to that. And unfortunately, it's been pretty successful. Um, but let's uh, get to the third approach here. 
Quote, a third approach involves a blend of concealment and deception. Construct hidden soundproof departments and workshops beneath or within an owned building, ostensibly used for other purposes. Since such chambers could be blast, fire, and fallout resistant, this approach offers protection against nuclear attack as well as day-to-day -day predation. The family of Anne Frank, a diary of a young girl, tried unsuccessfully to hide this way during the Nazi occupation of Holland. The hidden chamber approach seems to have much potential, also many problems. I have not attempted it, nor even thought much about it. I welcome the insights of anyone who has. And quote, and uh, you kind of have a, uh, and I think you mentioned it in a, previ in previ in a previous episode of Vanu, but uh, you actually have a, you, you knew a guy that uh, did kind of have the, uh, he, he got, did kind of pursue the hidden chamber approach, right? Yes, yes. This was the uh, the car mechanic who was like restoring different cars in that garage that he privately owned and so forth. And yeah, because he, uh, you know, let's just let's just say the state considered him not exactly acceptable to get loans and all that because he had a legal handicap, uh, which is why I kind of care about, you know, the, the whole, you know, felon, anybody being a felon is because they're legally disadvantaged. Uh, and all that by the court system. You know, it's not like he could just go and rent an apartment, right? And that that's so that that's kind of something to consider. So what are your other options when it comes to shelter? And what he did was that he already owned the building that those those cars were in. So he basically had this kind of cordoned off area, which I think had been used previously by the previous owner as like an office space. But he basically converted into basically a kind of a makeshift, uh, like I think it was the equivalent of like a two bedroom apartment. And unfortunately, with what time I did have with him, I unfortunately didn't really kind of emphasize about his living quarters because I kind of felt that that was his own private space. But what I did notice from a distance, because I was in the garage a lot, uh, the portion of it, which was most of the building, um, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, he had uh, he had working electricity, he had his own working plumbing, um, and uh, he was also like growing things. Uh, I presume it's food, but maybe there was something else. Uh, plausible deniability over here, okay? Um, but yeah. He he was he was pretty self sufficient for being, and technically I guess that was more of a smaller city where he was. But I would say even a more built up, like more larger city, uh, kind of like Austin or or even kind of the Dallas or even a, even a really big metroplex like the Dallas DFW metroplex, um, or I should say Dallas Fort Worth. Uh, I, I think like a method like that hidden bedchamber, like what that car mechanic did, I, I think would be. Uh, uh, potentially viable. And unlike the previous two methods of, I guess, that kind of gray, purely individual gray man anonymity or the ghetto approach, I think the uh, I, th I think the hidden bedchamber has a lot of potential that I think is rather untapped. No, I mean, that, that's certainly an incredible story. But uh, but yeah, I think this is a, this is a viable approach. Uh, I, I really do. And if and if you tie it in with a business, too. Uh, if you have an above ground business, and you know, as 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 per guerrilla capitalism, again, I'll bring it up. Uh, if you have kind of a side hustle uh, that you can do underground, uh, you know, all 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 the better. Uh, like a mechanic shop, if you were to do, uh, you know, work for other on work on other people's vehicles as uh, kind of his uh, underground occupation that he did on the weekends or something, and he could kind of tie that in, uh, and he could buy the parts through his business, and uh, and that would be something that'd be tax deductible, all those good things. And then also, um. If he tied in with his business and it was actually at the mechanic shop like it was, uh, I know there's something here in Illinois, and maybe it's more widespread, I don't know, but if there's an actual property, or I guess if there's actually an actual home on a property, they increase your taxes. So if you tied in with the business, then I think that'd be a cheaper route to go. Uh, so, I mean, there are a lot of benefits that come from that if you're kind of doing the above ground and underground thing. Uh, for pursuing venuance, I think it would be a, an interesting kind of... Uh, <laughs> It'd be it'd be interesting. I think uh, you know for, for freedom pioneers, I think it'd be a fun way. How can I trick the state? You know, how can I do this? I think it'd be a, a very fun venture. Yeah, and like I mentioned in previous episodes, I still like my potential idea, which still needs to be tested. About uh, you know maybe maybe doing something in an industrial park. You know, get either buying and or leasing some space, and then trying to see if there's a way to have. Uh, you know, construct something within the structure itself. Again, kind of like what was mentioned earlier this episode, uh, the the um, the quote from Libertarian Connection number five, where you're you're talking at that point something like a speakeasy in terms of like the actual infrastructure itself, uh, maybe, but not maybe, exactly maybe like uh, maybe like Aurora from Alongside Night, only more of kind of an apartment-based thing, not sure a wise and sure that'd be another possibility too, but um. But yeah, I, I think that'd be a, a, a very interesting approach, and it's not the most, you know, it's not the most, 
the, the, the most, uh, you know, costly strategy as far as initial investment goes we propose in this podcast. I'm sure, you know, a submarine... Uh, actually, well, Jason and I figured out the price of... Uh, there was a submarine mentioned in uh, one of those publications, and it came out to like $3.3.5 million, you know, adjusting for inflation. Uh, and that would have been like the cheapest one available back in the 1980s. Uh, $3.5 million, uh, you know, that's what it would cost today. Uh, an aircraft carrier, a decommissioned aircraft carrier, a lot more than that, I'm sure. Uh, so, so you know, an industrial park. We were looking one, uh, one, one day, Kyle. Uh, probably, probably about a year ago at this point, I would imagine, or thereabouts. Uh, I mean, as far as industrial parks go, there's a kind of a wide varying uh, price there. And uh, you know, for some, if I remember correctly, there were some that were under a million dollars. So that's yeah. not the actual. I mean. It's actually not that far outside of the realm of possibilities, uh, you know, like <laughs> when contrasting that from like a decommissioned aircraft carrier. Right, of course. So, again, there, um, I, I would assume there's a lot more than one way to skin a cat here. But, yeah, I, I still think that if we're talking about doing urban Vanu, then I think hidden bedchamber is is definitely a way that to definitely is one type of way to kind of explore that in, in more detail. Right, right. So let's get to the uh, the fourth approach here, which I think is also interesting. He says, quote, a, th a fourth approach, build a den or camouflage camp on unowned land, such as a public park. This approach has been in much in has much in common with wilderness faunu. Major advantage, easier access to city. Disadvantages, more difficult to conceal. General hazards of city, including smog and nuclear threat. A man built a shack and lived undetected for 17 years in a Portland city park, reported in preform and form. Park squatting might be done easiest by Venuans who first develop concealment skills in unpopulated remote areas, then opt for better city access, end quote. In some ways, I think that this approach of the park squatting, I think would be the way to put, kind of put it, is it, in, in some ways it kind of reminds me of the ghetto approach, but not quite because, you know, I mean, I mean the ghetto – is trying to become a permanent autonomous zone, right? That that's kind of what it aspires to be, right? Whether it's a ch whether what the old or what used to be a Chinatown, right? It it wants to be a Paz, but it's not quite there yet. It never really got it, kind of got there, because it's really just more, you know, an, an area within the city, right? The park squatting, in in some ways, I I think is. It's it's and it's not even a temporary autonomous zone necessarily either, right? It says build a den or camouflage camp on unknown lands such as a public park. So yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess somebody could build a shack. Uh, again, the example he gave, uh, the guy built a shack, live undetected in a Portland city park. But then I guess it depends what kind of city park, right? I mean, if we're talking about like a like a world famous one like uh, Central Park in New York City, I think it does in Manhattan or somewhere, right? Uh, yeah, that, that's not going to work too well. <laughs> no, right? there's, there's a lot of traffic that goes through there. <laughs> right. So not, not all city parks are created equal. Um, however, there are also other parks like say around Austin, for instance, that are rarely used, or shall we say they're really only used by the, uh, by the outdoorsy and somewhat yuppified or hipster fied, uh, <laughs> REI for instance, oh, right? So a little bit of the tragedy of the commons then. Just a little bit, yeah. But again, you know, uh, you know, so people would be already. But what I'm saying is that, in, e even in that sense, it wouldn't be necessarily bad to kind of live there all the time. You just have, would have to move around a little bit. So that's that's getting closer to a temporary autonomous zone, is I, I I guess in some sense. So as long as the den or camouflage camp was movable, I think it's probably conceivable that if somebody really wanted to kind of give that a try, they could probably do it in certain areas of Austin. Sure. Um, I would say this, that that particular example should probably be fielded to Alex Answer, right? He's a, nat a native Portlander, right? Uh, regarding at least the situation here in Austin, I would say if someone wanted to hypothetically experiment with the uh, park squatting approach, um, maybe better to do that in South Austin, of course, being defined as going south of the Colorado River. See, I'm north of the Colorado River, which is where most of the city is. Uh, so and and from my knowledge of the city parks, I don't personally suggest it. If you go south, though, you have half a decent chance, not a guarantee, but you have a chance because there's more like parks and they're larger and it's more for the yuppified REI crowd who are backpacking and people who are kind of gone for days at a time. So if you have like these larger parks, even within city limits, 
that where it's the normal activity is kind of more like a hiking backpacking thing, especially if there's like campsites maybe, or maybe not, maybe campsites are not exactly the right approach. I mean, I don't know. I mean, that, that one's debatable. Then, you know, that could be an option. Uh, but yeah, long story short, what I'm trying to say is that depending in certain areas of Stephen suburbia, especially if there were new areas that like, uh, the developers were just, just finished developing, Right outside those developments, like even in like, shall we say, the shared backyards, there are certain areas that are still have got heavy brush, not trees necessarily, but places that someone could hide. And on occasion, I've even found some of the homeless people there. So if the homeless people can occasionally do it. All right. So the fifth approach, quote, van nomadism with city squat spots, some differences from wilderness squatting, private land such as backyards of friends is probably safer than streets for long stays. The vehicle need not be a self need not be as self-contained, since utilities are close at hand. Off-the-road performance is important. Appearance, conventionality, license plates, etc., are important. End quote. So the slave tags, yeah, definitely necessary if you're going to be in the city. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, but uh, this is an interesting uh, an interesting one. So I know Alex Ansari did have city squats uh, city squat spots. Uh, in Portland, when he was so when he kind of started out his journey, um, so there are there are ways you can do it, uh, but also keep in mind, as I, as I said previously in in, in other episodes, uh, you know the state of survival society has a very negative conception of people living alternative lifestyles. Uh, there was one example that I brought up, where some lady was pursuing van nomadism in some sort of fashion, and uh, she's woken up with her tires slashed and her glad her you know her windshield broken and things like that. So. Um, so I guess it might be something and something to consider, but, um, you know, depending on the area, you know, maybe they'll be kind of friendly to you. I, I, I don't know. I'm sure that's a possibility, but, uh, I think he makes some wise points here and, uh, yeah. What do you think, Kyle? Well, first off for those folks who haven't yet listened to our, uh, second season episode on van nomadism, please do so because otherwise what I'm about to say is not going to make a lot of sense. And secondly, okay, so van nomadism with city squat spots. So Alex did a bunch, uh, and still does, uh, do, does a bunch of vlogging and such about, uh, you know, uh, living, uh, you know, living, you know, as as independently as he does. And, you know, uh, whether he was in certain areas of Colorado or even when he would have his adventures in uh, New Mexico, such as around the Taos area and so forth. Yeah, there were times where, yes, he would be on, like, uh, the BLM land and, and park, you know, and, 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 like, there was, like, a legal, maybe not an interstice necessarily, but a loophole of sorts at least, where you could stay there for, what was it, like, 10 days at a crack before you have to get a permit or whatever. So he would do that, and then there were other times he'd go into the city, like Taos and other places, and just uh, kind of find good places to park for the night. And uh, and it wasn't uh, completely unusual in some areas that were uh, a little bit more hostile, like Alabosa, where uh, the cops would kind of give him a little bit of grief, not completely violate his rights or anything, but kind of go, you know, tap, tap, tap at 3 a.m. or in the middle of the night or whatever and tell him, hey, get along the road now. And see, and see, I think that's a form of bigotry, honestly, that there that people who are rooted to a specific locale uh, think that uh, they like own everything outside that locale. And so whenever they see transients, even if the transients haven't done anything wrong, that somehow the transients are criminal types because they're transients. So, I mean, it's the kind of bigotry that like the Romanian gypsies have always historically experienced because they're a mobile people, right? At least historically anyway. And anybody who's, you know, gypsy-ish, uh, they're, they must be bad people too. Even when they haven't done anything wrong, uh, they're still bad because they're mobile. So there's this constant prejudice against people whose lifestyles are mobile as opposed to more stationary. So that I, I've never really liked that about the servile society. Like it's like, okay, even if you don't want to be mobile in terms of your home being mobile, fine, but why are you assuming that people's homes that are mobile are somehow a bunch of criminals? Right, yeah, it's it's the uh, it's it's the difference in lifestyle. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's van nomadism, uh, whether it's survivalism or prepping, uh, it really really does not matter what sort of strategy, uh, you know, it it it, it takes uh, what what sort of uh, form the strategy takes. It's uh it's it's contrary to the 
the culture and the <clears throat> lifestyles of those in the servile society. I mean, that's that's what it comes down to as far as I understand it. And the controlled schizophrenia, the idea that this person is taking initiative themselves, therefore, uh, you know, uh, I'm a slave. I'm jealous of them. Uh, you know, they, they have more freedom than I do. Uh, you know, let me just use government violence against them and uh, make me feel better. You know, they aren't doing it, so, you know, you know, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine where I'm at. Uh, it's kind of the mindset that I, that I think, uh, you know, really, really is, is, is predominant here. Um, and it's unfortunate. Uh, it, it really is, but it's not surprising. Uh, it's not surprising in the least bit. Right. And so I think that in terms of doing uh, practicing Vanu in the cities, I mean, other than maybe the gray man, you know, a, a, you know, a, anonymous approach like living in an apartment or something, leased under another name or or something to that effect, probably the easiest approach probably would be the van nomadism with city squat spots. To be perfectly honest, because I mean, the ghetto approach is That's is rather issues. quite limited. Yeah, the park squatting also has some issues. Yep. Although arguably the, maybe the next best thing, the van, the van nomadism, maybe. And then, of course, the bedchamber thing is still where I would kind of put my two cents. But it requires uh, a lot of other things to kind of fall into place, which I'm um, saying is not is not impossible. But it's not something that you can necessarily do tomorrow. The van nomadism with city squat spots you can totally do tomorrow. And that that's kind of where it's at, at least for right now. At least I think so. Right, right, and I mean, that was, you know, good, good. Con I guess good concluding thoughts there. Although we aren't really at that point, uh, I, I guess. We, I guess we we kind of are, but uh, but yeah, a lot of these things will will, will be saved to season three, and not, uh, I mean, not, I mean, <laughs> and not because we are just saving it for season three. I mean, this is this is something that you know Rayo wrote a page and a half in his book, uh, maybe five hundred words, and uh, then one one quote elsewhere. So this is something that Kyle and I have to develop pretty much entirely on our own, uh, except for, for, I mean, we always want to hear from you guys. I mean, what, what do you think about some of these strategies? What, what do you think are potential ways, uh, potential you know, strategies and ways to overcome obstacles uh, for pursuing benevolence in the city? So I guess it's not, doesn't fall all on us, but as far as producing the podcast, uh, at least in, I guess, the foreseeable future, then yeah, I mean we we've got a lot of thinking thinking and talking to do on these subjects. Uh, I remember when I mentioned we we were talking about the industrial park thing. I think we talked for like four hours on Vanu and Cities that night. Yeah. So this is this is going to be a pretty massive subject. Um, but again, you know, if it affects eighty percent of the people uh, in America, I think it's it's uh, well worth our time. But uh, any other closing thoughts, man? Yeah, two in particular. So I kind of as, – as much as I like the character, I really do disagree pretty strongly with the fictional Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. Batman, about the whole, uh, oh, uh, Gotham needs to be saved. No, Gotham – Oh, boy. We're getting into comics, are we? <laughs> actually, it's – Actually, it's rel actually, I think it's relevant here because a lot of the whole so-called so superhero fiction of one type or another. But I think I think Batman more is the most is probably the most crystal clear about it, and and le ironically least ambiguous because because uh, it's obviously ambiguous about other things like human nature and such. But the whole thing about well, well we must save the city thing. Uh, you know, we we're combating e even in the dark, even the Christopher Nolan. Um, it was the second movie, the one with the Joker, Heath Ledger's The Joker, uh, The Dark Knight. Uh, the whole thing about oh we're you know oh we're, uh, we're we're struggling for the soul of Gotham kind of thing. And all I'm thinking is like, okay, I appreciate some of the themes, I appreciate you know some other things going on here, but the actual like you know, <laughs> uh, uh, what's at stake here, at least in one sense, is that they're they're vying for control of a city. And all I'm thinking is like, why? I mean, like the Joker yeah, there's, almost there's, makes there's little to nothing worth saving in in the state of survival society, and eighty percent of the survival society exists in cities. So, yeah. So and... yeah, I think I think some individuals, if they, um, I think some individuals need to be presented with the information, and some of them will will take the action. But uh, I mean, the the whole saving thing kind of comes from a, I don't know, kind of this uh, savior complex. It, it kind of seems like an appeal to authority to me. 
Well, of course it is. And and I mean, in some ways, I mean, the Joker makes more sense to me. Unfortunately, though, he went really hardcore on the whole nihilistic. Let's uh, let's coerce people all day. Uh, but uh, but, you know, he was right about at least a few things, at least I think so, uh, that people are controlled schizophrenics. As remember, he said, you know, their moral code is a bad joke. Watch when the uh, when the chips are down. These people will show you what they're really like and they'll eat each other. But then remember, as a psycho, he also admitted, you know, oh, I'm not a monster, Batman. I'm just ahead of the curve. You know, so he knew he was bad, but at least he was honest about it. He was just also trying to expose the hypocrisy of other people as well. So he, you know, it was kind of like the bad guy trying to point out that other people who think they're good are actually bad, just like himself. Although, but at least he's honest about it. So not to go on too long about that, but I, I, I think the Joker was was a lot more on point there rather than the whole we need to save the city because reasons. Like there's no explanation there at all from the so-called other side because it's a false debate. I mean, the city's not worth saving, period. It's not worth saving, and I would disagree with the Joker that it's even worth destroying because, remember, that's what he was more about or because he's a nihilist. So, you know, it's not worth saving or destroying, just like it kind of has a life of its own, so let them nuke themselves and try not to get caught in the middle kind of thing is kind of how I view it. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I think it's uh, an interesting example to toss in there, but, uh, uh, but your, your second point. Oh, yes. Okay, so this is kind of going more into kind of a different subject about the second realm. I would say this. In terms of developing Vanu in cities more generally, I think what was mentioned uh, in the book, uh, what was it called? The second realm book on strategy was the notion about anonymized remote controlled access control. So in other words, using some stuff you would kind of get from the more uh, crypto anarchists, uh, whether it's using cell phones to like digitally control locks, for example, uh, to actually kind of have defined borders in a sense between uh, of certain physical spaces that borders, are, I'm triggered. Go ahead. Yeah, really. Borders of source, private property borders is what I'm talking about, obviously. Uh, that is a, is, a, is a form of segregation of certain areas within, let's say, a city, uh, which is that first realm, which is where everybody's getting coerced. That's the servile society. It's basically the same thing. But then segregating that off into the second realm, which is kind of like where a lot of us live. So uh, in a manner of speaking, where, where people's liberty and property are respected and so forth. And I think that's going to be the next major development. That's kind of my hypothesis here looking into the future is that whether it's the anonymized remote control to access control or even the further refinement of that, which was also referred to as the anonymized remote control defense systems, such as, <clears throat> well, you have to defend those borders somehow, right? Or let's say... If your private nightclub or home gets raided by the cops, well, in order to buy enough time to evacuate everybody out, you have to have certain defense systems that are not necessarily designed to wipe out, let's say, the, the raiding criminals, but instead more as a delaying tactic in order to buy time for an evacuation. I think that's pretty much – a lot of the techniques that were mentioned in that book on the second realm, I think that's going to be the more further refinement on Vanu and on practicing Vanu in the city. So I think there's a meeting of the minds there, very much so. Right, right. And my my hypothesis is similar uh, in regards to the second realm. I mean, there's a I don't want to get into this at all. It pisses me off. This ha we we talked about this on Liberty Intertech Radio back in 2015. Uh, when this came around uh, last time, people are freaking out about it again. Uh, but uh, uh, so, so, so instead of the, uh, you know, the so-called government corporations like Comcast and AT&T, rather than, than them, you know, I, even though they're so subsidized and controlled, it's not even, not even funny. They're basically, basically the government, uh, you know, handing that over to the FCC directly, uh, seems like a terrible strategy, but I don't even care about it. I'm not worried about it at all. And, uh, it's because, uh, you know, the second realm of infrastructure is coming about, uh, especially when you consider, you know, off-grid energy, uh, which is, uh, you know, ever decreasing in price. And uh, then kind of mesh networking for the Internet. So uh, and blockchains for the financial, I guess, the, the financial portion of it uh, right. and also a lot of other things, too. So, I mean, yeah. And I mean, don't yes. forget and, and don't forget the whole concept of urban homesteading. And by the way, there are 
uh, publicly avowed uh, urban homesteads right here in Austin. The only difference for like a second realm version of it would obviously they wouldn't be uh, publicly known, but they would. And I wouldn't be surprised if they're here already in town just because of the ones that are publicly visible. So like even urban homesteads. So instead right, of right. going yeah, out so. into rural areas, you just do it in town. Right, right. So so that's another aspect, too. And I had Jim and Baconic back on and talk about permaculture farming and crypto anarchism. And, uh, you know, I guess as far as part of the second realm, the centralized food production system we have now, uh, you know, there's a solution to that, too. And it's called permaculture farming. So when we talk a lot in this podcast, I mean, it could be disparaging towards folks in the state of society. And it may seem kind of depressing. But as Ray, as as Ray said, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Uh, uh, oh man, I, I was setting sail for sunnier waters. That's what I can come up with, come up with off the top of my head. Uh, only I guess uh, <laughs> in the abstract, setting sail, uh, setting sail to uh, the second realm. Uh, but there are a lot of things right. that there's there's no re there's no need to be discouraged, worried, fearful. Um, obviously, keep your wits about you and and, and know your enemy. Uh, which is the state and also you know uh, private coercers, those in the state of survival society that uh, partake in that sort of thing. Uh, but there's a lot to be positive for. There's a lot to be hopeful for. Uh, but I don't want to, uh, you know, I, I always feel strange kind of getting into that mode, Kyle. But when it comes <laughs> to crypto anarchism and the the progression towards the second realm, not the progressive and the not the progression in like the progressive sense, but but uh, there's, oh, yeah. there's there's a lot of there's a lot of positives, man. I mean, things are changing quickly. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. LibertyUnderAttack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom. The intent of the GhostPad is to offer a complete security and privacy hardened computer system that is built from the ground up to be an effective direct action countermeasure for those who want to actively resist the privacy intrusions of the, the entire surveillance state Hydra, both public sector and private sector. A user-friendly computer that the owner maintains exclusive control over every aspect of its operation and has complete control over who accesses what data. A ghost pad is your virtual corner of the room where the cameras, microphones, and other data collection devices have no power. After all, power comes from ownership, which is exclusive control. Unlike practically any other available option, when you buy a ghost pad you are truly its owner. And while the masses beg and bleed to their political corporate masters to loosen their chains, ghost pad owners can use their systems as virtual bolt cutters and cut themselves free. Ghost pads are high-quality business rugged laptops that have had the security compromising system firmware, BIOS firmware, Intel management engine, etc., removed and replaced with more secure, free and open-source alternatives. 
the closed source binary BIOS firmware has been removed from the system board and replaced with free, as in freedom, alternatives as well as the Intel management engine also being neutralized. That combination makes them more secure by design, and preemptively thwarts any attempts by threat actors, both public and private, to gain access by exploiting its vulnerabilities, either by an engineered in and hidden backdoor, or a zero-day exploit in the factory, supplied firmware or the Intel management engine. Perhaps the most important security privacy enhancing feature these systems have, is the neutralizing of the aforementioned Intel management engine, I'm. The IM is a separate computer and a computer that is embedded into all Intel platforms made since 2008. It has its own operating system called Minix. It operates out of band meaning that your primary CPU has no access to monitor what it is doing, and it has direct access to all the hardware that your primary CPU does, making it the ultimate embedded spying device. If you can't audit what it's doing, it's always on when the computer is plugged in, or has battery power, it has its own network interface with its own MAC address that can bypass any system firewall configuration, it has its own storage you have no access to, it can access your microphone, camera, keyboard, can record keystrokes, and display, can screenshot your encrypted communications, while you are reading and writing them. The IM can only be disabled, by modifying the system's firmware. That can only be accomplished by using an external programmer to reprogram the chip that stores the system's firmware. Only select laptop models can be modified. We concentrate on the compatible models with the highest performance available. We offer models that are 2x as powerful as any configurations sold and supported by Lenovo. Transitioning your computing activity to privacy-hardened platforms is a direct action strategy to resist the attempts at total omnipresence by the surveillance state. To put it simply, these systems are some of the few available that are likely compromised in some way on the firmware level, so they are some of the most secure and private available for use cases where that those attributes are the most important. It is also why systems configured this way are considered as ideal to use as a base to install a security privacy hardened OS, such as Cubes OS, Parrot OS, or other privacy focused Linux distributions. On. To view the full selection of ghost pads, ghost phones, and other privacy tools available via Liberty under attack publications, just visit libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. What are you waiting for? Step up your security culture today. Again, libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. Liberty under attack publications, share your story, find your freedom.